So we kind of skipped over it because we were solving the radical equation. And then right after explaining the radical equation, they jumped into the uh, absolute value equation concept. But I kind of want to table it until we practice all of the radical equations, because those are pretty intense. Okay, and so I wanted to make sure that we got examples of all of those and maybe some had some kind of reference to go back to when you were doing your homework for the radical. Those are big. Um, another kind of equation in the same section is the um, absolute value. And so for that section, it really comes down to a fact that take the absolute value of negative three. What is that? Three. And if you take the absolute value of positive three, what is that? It's also three. And so the interesting thing about absolute value equations is that whatever's inside those absolute value bars, they could be negative or it could be positive. Regardless, once you take the absolute value, you'll still get that same answer, right? And so essentially what that means is that when we're solving absolute value equations, a lot of the time we will end up with two answers, okay? But there's also something interesting to point out. What would have to be in this bar in order for me to get zero? The absolute value of what would give me zero? Mm -hmm. It has to be zero, right? And there's no other options because there's no such thing as a negative zero, right? So for that one, there's only one solution. So that's a special case where you only get one solution. How about this? Can this ever happen? Can I ever type in a number and take the absolute value of it and get a negative? No, because the absolute value by definition has to be a positive, right? So the fact that you have the bars here means that this could never equal a negative number. So when you do have a negative number out there, it means that there's no solution to that equation. So what I've done is I've taken these three facts, okay? And I'm kind of trying to summarize them for your equations. Now notice that when I put X inside the bars here, it could be the variable X, or it could be a whole expression. Like in this example that they gave us, it's X minus two, that's a whole expression. And that's okay. And whatever's in the bars, you have these three cases that could happen. The first case that can happen is that the number on the other side is a positive number. If that number on the on the right hand side is a positive number, then you do get two different solutions. One where the inside stuff could be the positive of this number, or the inside of that bars could be the negative of that number because I would get the positive, right? Here, if I take if the a is a negative. That means I have a negative number over here, and we already know that absolute values cannot equal negative numbers, okay? And so that would be the case where there's no solution. And then the last case is the one we talked about where there's only one answer. If you have an expression inside the bars, all you need to do is set that expression equal to zero and solve it, and that's the only solution that you'll have, because there's no such thing as like positive and negative zero, right? You'll get the same exact answer twice. So what we need to know here is that, yes, these are the three um, different rules, but the first step you're always going to want to do in solving these equations is isolate that absolute value. So whatever's inside there, I'm putting an X, but it really stands for X or any expression, right? So you first isolate the bars, then you consider which case you have. and apply it. I'm skipping words here, but I should say identify which case you have, right? And then apply it. So is my number over here a positive, a negative, or is it a zero? My only options. And then once I figure out what I have and I applied it, um, this one, you usually want to check your answers. It's not necessary to check the answers, but it always helps, especially if you're taking a test, right? It's great that you know how to find it, but then just double check to make sure that it's good. Okay. Okay, so with all of that information, I am gonna go over 
I don't know what page it is in your book, but to the practice number five, because we, we did all the other practice problems, but we didn't do the rest of these because we hadn't talked about them yet. So I'm going to go to this problem here. Now, in number five, do I need to do step one? Is there any like coefficient or an exponent or something in the denominator? Anything outside of those parts that I would have to get rid of? No. So I don't even need to do step one. Step one, I'm just going to completely skip over because I already have bars equal to a number, don't I? Then the second step is to identify which case I have. So for me, is it going to be case one where it's positive, case two where the number is negative, or case three where the number is zero? Which case do I have here? Case one. Case one. So then if I apply that case, I'd have to set whatever's on the inside equal to that number as a positive, or whatever's on the inside equal to the negative of that number. Okay. So I'm going to take the whole expression inside those bars and equal it to a positive total, write my word or, and then the same expression equal to the negative of that number, which is negative 12 in this case. And then I have to solve both of those uh, equations there. I'm going to keep this here for reference. Sorry. You do, so you're going to have two solutions for this one. Mm -hmm. Anytime that that's a positive number, you will have two solutions. And we'll verify that they're actually both solutions too when we get to the check part. Yes, so I'm going to minus three for both equations. Since the expression part is exactly the same, what I'm doing will be exactly the same for both equations, but the numbers will turn out different because this one's positive and that one's negative, right? So over here, I'll get nine, but over here, I will get negative 15. So I did the same thing on minus three on both equations, but I get different values because we had positive 12 and negative 12. Then I'm gonna divide by five on both equations. And here I get a fraction, nine fifths, positive. And here, this is not a fraction because it'll reduce to just negative three. If you ever catch me making a mistake, let me know, right? You don't want to have wrong stuff <laughs> on our note. Right? So then that's great. Step three is to check, and we will go ahead and check both of those. So if I do this, Five times a nine fifths plus three equal to 12. That's the big question. Are they actually equal? Okay, well, let's see. What happens when you multiply these? If you use the calculator or you don't use the calculator, what happens when you multiply these? What do you get? You do get nine. And so then, and me, I will just cancel the fives, right? And you get the nine. And then what's nine plus three? Twelve. And is the absolute value of twelve equal to twelve? Mm -hmm. So this one does check out. This one checks out. How do you write that in the calculator? Do you just do you just ignore those uh, the lines? Good question. Yes, I am not typing in all of it in my calculator. I'm only typing in this part in the calculator. So that I can do, right? Nine over five. And so I'm only typing in this. You could type in a whole expression. If I copy that and I do plus three, you could do the whole expression. The only thing you won't be able to do is the absolute value. But I think that you can do absolute value in here. Let me check. Yep, there it is. So let me get out of there again so I can show you. So I could type the whole left side in there and just see if I get 12 in my calculator. But let's see how it looks. It's not going to look like bars. Okay, it's going to say ABS and then it's going to have parentheses. And those parentheses with the ABS in front is what acts like our bars. Okay, so I'm going to click on the math button 
And then I'm going to go to the right where it says number. And then you can either press the number one to select apps, or you can just press enter to select apps. Either way, both of those will actually put this on your entry. So I'm going to hit enter. Oh, oh that's the part. So I'll make the other graphing calculator. This is nice. I like this calculator now more. Okay, so once you have those bars, then yeah, you can literally make it look like the paper. Oops, that's not what I need to do. Parentheses, fraction nine over five, close plus three. So yay, I learned something new about this calculator. It actually, it doesn't keep it. The other calculators do this. And then you have to do the whole thing, right? And it stays like that. It doesn't ever put the bars on the other calculator. But this one, super awesome. It makes it look exactly like it does on the paper. Which is good because then you know if you type it in there, right? Okay. So I'm going to hit enter and I got 12. So this checks out. Okay. Now let's go try. Oh, I should have erased that. I'm going to copy that because instead of writing everything all over again, all I want to do is delete this fraction and type in a negative three, but I have to hit insert. Because if I just type in three, it's going to type over my parentheses. So I have to do second and insert right there so I could enter another value. And I also get positive 12. So this one checked out as well. So both of them do check out. Now, this is the easy version. This is fantastic. It's awesome. But what happens when you get expressions where you don't know if it's going to be positive or negative? Okay. And that's where we come into number six. So I don't know what x is, right? I don't know if x is a positive number or if it's a negative number. If it's a negative number, depending on what that negative number is, the whole expression over here could be positive still, or it could be negative, right? It just depends on what that x value is. So what we do is we just solve it as if it were a positive, right? And we get both of the solutions. And then we have to check both of those solutions because we truly don't know which x values are gonna work and which one won't, okay? So here it is super important that you must check your answer, okay? So I'm gonna go through the same steps. Of, do I have my bars expression isolated? Yeah. It is, it's the only thing on the left side, right? So that one's done. Then step two is to identify the case, but since I'm hanging in balance, always default to case one, when you have this stuff, expression equal to an expression, okay? Always default to case one when you have that situation going on. And then just don't forget at the end to check the answers. Now this problem's gonna be a lot longer than the last problem because it's a quadratic. There's a squared in it, right? So I, I'm gonna do what case one says to do. Take this expression, and equal it to exactly the same expression that's on that side. But then I've got to put my word or and take the same expression that's on the inside and equal it to the negative of the other expression. Now you can write this step. Normally I don't. Normally what I do is I change all of these guys signs. So I change that to a negative 4x and I change that to a negative 36. This is what I usually default to for the negative side. They just change everybody's sign. Because isn't that what distributing this negative is going to do? Isn't it just going to change everybody's sign? So instead of wasting my paper and writing this line down, I just do it automatically. Okay, And that's okay to do. It's not okay if you forget to do that. right? And it's definitely not okay if you just do this because that's not the negative of everything on that side, right? That's only the negative of one term, not the negative of everything, okay? So we have two equations to solve. They both have an x squared in them. So I'm gonna have to solve this one by minusing 4x 
and then minus C36. So I will get zero on the right hand side, and on the left hand side, I will get positive 5x minus 36. And I can factor that. It is going to be x and x, 9 and 4, a plus and a minus. And always double check if you have to foil this in your head, foil it in your head. If you have to foil it on paper to check, scribble it over here and foil it. But make sure your factoring step is correct. If you have to do the whole AC method to factor it, then get it done on the side, okay? Don't do it in the line of your equation, okay? If you have side work to do, please make sure you actually do it on the side. So then I would have to set this equation equal to zero, this equation equal to zero. Here I will get negative nine as my answer. And here I will get positive four. I do need to check those, but at least I know that those are two possible answers. Now on the other side, when we did the negative, kind of have an example how to solve the quadratic over here, but how would I do it over here? What would be my first step to do on this side? Mm -hmm. And while I'm moving things over, what else can I move over? So then those will both go away if we need zero on the right. But on the left, what do I, am I end up with? And then the 36, right? Okay, now this one, yeah, I think we can't know. Both nine and four again, but this time they both have to be positive. Because positive nine times positive four is a positive 36, but positive nine plus positive four is that positive 36, right? And then I have to set each one equal to zero. And so then I get X equal to negative nine and X equal to negative four. So what are the possible solutions here? How many do I have? Three. Correct, only three, why only three? Correct, it's the same, right? So I only need to list it once and then we have this positive four and then we have this negative four. How will we know which ones are actual solutions that I can type into my answer box in web assignment? Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to actually do that in parts. I can't do a whole equation in my calculator. So I'm going to have to plug in one number into the left side, see what I get, plug that same number into the right side and see what I get. And then they should match, right? In order for this to be an actual solution, the two sides should match. So I'm going to start by plugging it the negative nine first. So we're checking just the negative nine. And I'm actually going to do my programming calculation. So that way, all I have to do is copy it and enter. Okay. So I'm going to type in the absolute value first. Oh no, so I have to enter my my number first. So negative nine store as x. Now every time I type in an x, I'm going to plug in a negative 9. Okay. So that was negative 9 and then the store button and then x. Now I'm going to type in this expression. So map over the number and hit enter to get the bars and then I'm going to do x squared plus 9x. Get out of the bars. So that looks exactly like the left hand side, right? So it's going to plug in negative nine and I get zero. Now I need to plug in negative nine into here and I have to get the same zero, okay? And I do, which means this one does check out. Okay. Now I want to check positive four. So now I'm going to go four store as x and hit enter so that it saves it, okay? So now the x is 4. All I have to do is go back up here and highlight 
the absolute value expression and hit enter and it's 52. It's okay, it doesn't matter what number it is. You just need to plug it on the other side and make sure it's the same, right? So let's go back to that expression on the right hand side and hit enter and then enter again to plug it in. And I also get 52. So this one checks out as well. Now the last one, negative four stores X. So we're gonna go back to the left side expression and we get 20. Then we're gonna go plug it into the right side. And we also get 20. So this one checked out as well. So when it comes to writing your actual solutions, they are all actual solutions. But it could be possible that only some of them work. It could be possible that none of them work. What happens if none of them work? What do you say if your answer is a pure? No solution. Right, no solution. Okay, so I think that was the end of that section. So we don't have any more absolute value problems. So we are going to go now into the quadratic formula. We have not talked about the quadratic formula before. Um, if you saw one in the review, that was an error. If you saw one on the test, I tried to remediate that, right? Um, because we have not talked about the quadratic formula yet. Some of you may have had experience with it in the past, but for us, we have not gone through it. So, This section is really just about the quadratic formula. The only thing is that when we get to this section, we're only doing, um, oh, that's the front page of this. Uh, only thing we're doing is how to use the quadratic formula. And then we might have an application problem or it's paragraph in which we have to apply the quadratic formula. And then we're also gonna do the quadratic formula that might give us um, imaginary answers. The quadratic formula has a square root in it. And so if the inside of that square root happens to be a negative number, that's why we would have imaginary answers, okay? And it, it can happen. So we just have to do the math and see what is inside that radical. So what is this saying? Because often in mathematics, you're taught the long way of solving a problem first. Then the longer method is used to develop shorter techniques. The long way stresses understanding and the short way stresses efficiency. For instance, you can think of completing the square as a long way of solving a quadratic equation. When you use completing the square to solve quadratic equations, you must complete the square for each equation separately. Um, and then this says that the solutions of the quadratic equation in the general form, ax squared plus bx plus c equal to zero, as long as you have an x squared, if a is equal to zero, this guy's missing, isn't it? Is that quadratic if that guy's missing? No, right? And it's a linear, not a quadratic. So that's the only reason why that's there. It's just make sure it actually has this x squared somewhere in your equation before you apply this formula. Now, all they did to get this formula is they took this and they completed the square and then they extracted the roots. Now, I could go through that whole process. You can go look at it in your book if you want to go look at it in your book. It takes time and I'm not going to do it, okay? But all they do is complete the square with the A, B, and C exactly as they are. They leave them as letters, okay? And they do the whole bit, and then eventually, once they extract the root, they end up with this expression, okay? So that's where it came from. It's just instead of completing the square all the time and extracting the roots all the time, well, we'll just memorize this formula and we have to do all of that other busy work, right? That's the whole point of the formula, okay? Now, there are songs to remember it. There are all kinds of things I heard. And I don't know why this one stuck in my brain because like already too much to call it, but this is the one that stuck in my brain and it said, the negative boy couldn't decide if he wanted to go to the house party. He didn't want to be square and miss out on four awesome chicks. So he went and the party was over by 2 a.m. And <laughs> that's how I remember it now. Um, <laughs> it's long, but that's how I remember it, okay? Um, so 
there's like little songs that you could YouTube. There's all kinds of ways to memorize it, but you definitely don't want to have it wrong when you got to use it, right? It needs to be correct <laughs> in order for you to apply it. Otherwise, you will get all the wrong answers. Okay. So you'll keep hearing me say it. I may not say the whole little thing that I just said <laughs> every single time. Um, but sometimes if my brain goes blank, I literally do say that out loud to myself just so that I can write it down right. Okay. Okay. So you do also need to be aware that it says plus or minus, but what that means is that there's actually two answers, right? There's one fraction with a plus in the middle, and then there's a whole other fraction with a minus in the middle. So this does represent two solutions, okay? But it could happen that you do end up with um, other kinds of answers. So you could get two solutions. I should say this, you could get two real solutions. You could get one real solution, or you could get zero real solutions. But if that happens, it's most likely because you have two imaginary solutions. But those are your three possibilities. And how would I know which ones I'm going to get? Okay. If after you compute everything and this stuff on the inside, okay, if what's inside the radical is greater than zero, meaning it's positive, then that means I am going to get two real solutions. Now, whether or not they're nice, perfect squares, or I'm going to be stuck with radicals in my answer, that's a totally different thing, okay? It all depends on if that stuff on the inside is a perfect square number, or it's not. But what if this stuff actually equals zero somehow, some way, coincidentally, it turns out to equal zero? Well, then in that case, when I take the square root of zero, it's just zero. So the only answer I'll get is the negative B over the two eight, just one answer. Because all of that radical stuff will be gone, all zero, right? And then the last situation is if whatever's inside that radical turns out to be negative, then I'm not gonna have any real solutions because when you have negatives, negatives inside the radical, you end up with imaginaries, right? So that's why you're saying you're gonna have two imaginary solutions. So there's a bunch of different cases here, three cases, and I'm pretty sure in the examples they're going to give us one of each kind, okay? This one actually has two kinds because it has one with a perfect square and then one without. So it should have four examples. I don't know that we're gonna have that many, but we shall see. Where are my examples? So there's one. Oh well, we'll see. Okay. This is what I just said. <laughs> so if that stuff, this part right here, right, the inside of the radical, if it's positive, you end up with two real solutions. Positive, two real. If it's zero, you end up with one real. If it's negative, you end up with no reals. But it does have two imaginary. And you have to be careful with web assignment because sometimes web assignment will specifically say, find the real solution. If it says, find the real solution, okay, if it has that phrase, find the real solution. Or if you're doing a word problem, because word to have imaginary answers, they're just not, okay? So if you see these words or you're used doing an actual word problem, in both of these cases, okay, if you get imaginary answers, you're going to omit, omit them. 
So if you get one real and one imaginary for some reason, or however it works, or you get two imaginaries, however the problem works out, you cannot put these as your answers. Okay. What happens if you get two imaginaries and you know that it cannot apply to real solutions and it cannot apply to a word problem? What would you tell the computer? Mm -hmm, no solution. So just be careful of that. If it literally says find the real solutions, then imaginaries don't pipe. And you cannot pipe in an imaginary answer. Okay? You have to either say there's no solution or only give them the real answers if there happens to be one. Okay? If you're doing word problems, I promise you we live in the real, real world, right? <laughs> so we're not going to get imaginary answers in those real word problems. Okay. Um, the other one, the way they'll phrase it is they'll say, find all the complex solutions. And in this case, that means real and imaginary are okay. And so you can enter both of those in the answer box. If it says find the complex solution. I just want to make it work because I noticed in the homework there are some that just say find the real solutions, and then there's other ones that say find the complex solutions. Okay, so with that information, I am gonna go ahead and to oh yeah, and it's just telling us that in case three. The square root would be negative, which means it'll be an imaginary number. Imaginaries are not real numbers. And then that's why you would end up with the two complex solutions. Remember, complex is another way of saying we're going to group in the imaginaries with us. Okay. Okay. So now, before they actually practice the formula, they're going to talk about some applications. So one of the applications that they have here is this kind of word problem where it has to do with dimensions. It could be the dimensions of a room, the dimensions of a board, a piece of paper, whatever it is, okay? But it's either square or rectangular in shape. Now, um, it says a square room, so it tells me how the shape of the room is. It's a square. The square room has an area of 144 square feet. Find the dimensions of the room. So even though you don't know what this side is, because it's a square, you know, the other side is also, they're all the same, aren't they? But when I go to calculate area, don't you do length times width, right? And the length here is x, because we don't know what it is. And the width is also x, which is where that x squared came from. And do I know what the actual area should be? Do I know what's plug in for a, according to that sentence? What is the area of the room? 144. Mm -hmm. And so then I'm just going to bring that 144 down as I'm going through my, my equations, right? Is this the same thing as that? It is. They just like the x squared on the left side, so they rewrote it differently. Okay. But that's where it came from. They don't kind of explain where it all came from. They do it a sentence, but I did it with a picture. And both are acceptable. That's why I tell you on the test, you just have to have an explanation, right? I don't care if it's in symbols or if it's in words. You just have to have something that explains what you're doing and why you're doing it, okay? So, dun, dun, dun. if I'm trying to solve this equation, I don't necessarily need to do the quadratic formula, do I? It sounds real easy to solve by doing the extraction, roots extraction. Because if I take the square root of both sides, I get x equals plus or minus whatever the hex square root of 144 is. And in this case, the square root of 144 is just 12. So I get two answers, x could equal 12 or x could equal negative 12. Does this make sense for the dimensions of a room? Negative 12. This one here. Not this one, right? This one does not make sense.
Sorry, I'm going to write this <laughs> with No negatives make sense whenever you're taking measurements. Okay, that means that something would have to be like inside itself, right? In order for it to be negative three inches of my body width, that would mean I'm going inside my body, right? Not outside. Okay, so you have to be very careful with your measurements. Normally, negatives are not okay. Now, what about a positive slope? Though? Does that make sense for the dimension of the room? Right. And so that's why they're telling us here that, that each side would have to be 12 feet long. You don't mention the negative, the negative just does not make sense in this application. Just like imaginary would not make sense in these applications. The bottom is just a paragraph explaining the same thing I just wrote up there. Okay. Now, another kind of example is it's the same thing. It's still, it's not, is it a room? It's still a room, but this time it's a rectangle, okay? And it's nice when they give you a figure, but sometimes they don't, and it's best to draw your own, okay? These though, I noticed they've been giving us the figures. So it says you have a rectangular sunroom that is three feet longer than it is wide and has an area of 154 square feet. Find the dimensions of the room. And so they already label it for you. You know, this one's the shorter, this one's the longer, right, visually. And they said that it is three inches longer than it is wide. So you don't know how wide it is. So they just use the W. You could use X, it doesn't matter what letter. They use W for width, but the length had to be three more than that. And so that's why they did plus three, okay? We got lucky though, because they already had those there. If they don't, we have to use that information to label the size of a rectangle, okay? Once we have that, we know that the length of the width of the room times the length of the room is gonna give you the area of the room. So they labeled everything for us. They said W was the width, W plus three was the length. And then we already know from the sentence that 154 was the area, right? Now they're putting it into this formula. So they're saying the width, which is W, times the length, which was W plus three, should equal the area, which is 154, okay? So they're literally just plugging in every expression for everything that's there, okay? Now that they have that, we're gonna distribute first, and then we're gonna move over that 154. So if I distribute these guys, we get W squared plus three W, still equal to 154, and then if I minus the 154 on both sides, that's where they get the zero and the minus 154 on this left hand side, okay? From there, they factored it. Um, now the 154, oh gosh, let's see, square root of 154 is 12. So I would have had to have gone down my numbers. It's nice that they factored it for me, right? But how would I have found those numbers on my own, okay? you literally would have had to have gone down this list, which takes a little bit of time. I try not to give you big numbers like that unless I'm, that's what I'm trying to test you on. That's not gonna go in, I don't tend to go in. Okay. Work. Work twenty-two. And so out of these four pairs, one and one fifty-four, two and seventy-seven, seven and twenty-two, and then eleven and fourteen. Which of those are going to subtract to give me three? The eleven and the fourteen, right? But then which one would have to be? If this is a positive, that would mean the bigger one would have to be positive, right? When I put them together, I have to take the sign of the bigger guy, right? So this being positive means that my 14 would have to be positive, therefore my negative would have to be on the 11. And then double check. If I multiply these together, do I get negative 154? We do. If I add these two numbers together, do I get positive three? We do. So then you know it's factored first. Once you have those factored, you just need to set each one equal to zero. So if I set the 
w minus 11 equal to 0, we get w equal to 11. If we set w plus 14 equal to 0, we get w equal to negative 14. Now, do both of these make sense as an answer? Only 11. This one does not make sense as an answer, right? You can't have a room being a negative 14 feet wide or 14 feet long, negative. It doesn't make sense. So that means that 11 is the only solution for the width. So we now know that the width is 11 feet. But if I want to find the length, how do we do that? Mm -hmm. We know that the length is W plus 3, right? And so if I put in 11 for W, that's where they're getting the 14 from. Okay, So that's why they're saying that the length is 14 feet. And so those are the dimensions. The length is 14 and the width is 11. And those are the two dimensions that you were asked to find. Be very careful in web assign because sometimes it already has like an L and a W. And you need to make sure that you're putting the 11 in the right spot and the 14 in the right spot. Because if you put them in the wrong spot, it'll say wrong, even though all your math is correct. Okay. Just make sure that you're putting the right one in the right box. It's important that you do this part. Because if you don't do the labels part, then you're more inclined to put the numbers in the wrong spots if you don't do the labels. If you do do the labels, then once you get your answer, you know exactly which measurement that answer goes to, right? So if I had used X's instead of W's, I really would have been at a loss if I didn't have my labels, okay? What the heck did I say X was at the very beginning? <laughs> Unless you wrote it down, you're going to have to go back and review and find out what you me as x, what you assigned x to be. So another kind of application that we commonly see is stuff that has to do with projectiles. So um, it says this involves an object that is falling or is vertically projected into the air. So it's only the motion that is happening in real life is that you're at the top of the building or you're standing up and you drop something. So the item is just having a straight um, path, right? It's just falling straight down. Or if I took a ball and I threw it exactly vertically up, it's just going vertical. That's it. That's the motion of the object. However, when you graph where that ball is, so I'm just pretend it's a ball, right? Wherever that ball is in every moment of time, okay? If you graph that on an X and Y axis like this, where this is your time and then this is the height of the ball, it actually graphs out to be a parabola like that, okay? Where the ball reaches some certain height after a certain time and that's as high as it's gonna go. And then eventually the ball starts falling down, right? If I'm at a building, it's only from here because the ball's already at its maximum height and it's just falling over time, isn't it, okay? So as time goes on, the ball is doing this. So that's why it maps out to a, a parabola here, okay? And sometimes if you're doing it at a building, it just looks like this, okay? So this is if I was doing it from the ground, and then this is if I was holding the ball from a building or standing up and then dropping it. Now, what does the equation look like? It looks like this, okay? They use S for position. I've also seen them use H for height. Okay, it just depends on the problem. And then the negative 16 T squared, um, that actually has to do with uh, gravity. So there's already a natural force that's gonna be pushing down on the ball. And that's why it's negative because it, is the, it pushes down on the ball, right? It doesn't help lift the ball up, it pushes it down. So that's why it's negative there. Then this number here, the coefficient of T, that's the velocity. So like, how fast did I throw this ball? What was the velocity of the ball when I just let it go, right? That's the speed of the ball. And then this S0 is what's called the initial position. So where did the ball come from? Did it come from the ground? Did it come from the top of the building? Did it come from a person who's like five feet tall? And so the graph looks like that, right? How far up did the graph go? That's what this number is, okay? So that number would be up here for this picture. It would be here for that picture, or it would be on the origin for this image, okay? But that's all where the ball started at, okay? Did it start on the ground? Maybe something popped it up? Did 
Did it start up at the top of the building? Did it start um, at the height of a person or an another object? Okay, it all depends. So let's see. The third application. Oh, they don't give me all the applications. Uh -huh. They're only going to pick a couple. So there's another application, which is the Pythagorean theorem, and that has to do with triangles, right? So if for some reason you're not given rectangles in your scenario, you're talking about a triangle in your scenario. And for some reason, they only give you two bits of information on this triangle. First thing I need to tell you is that when you draw a right triangle, that means there's a right angle. I obviously don't know how to draw, trust me. If I draw that right, this is the 90 degree angle, which is the little um, corner. That's the right angle of the right triangle. Okay. It could also be over here. It could go upside down. It doesn't matter which way this triangle is facing, as long as it has one 90 degree angle. Okay. Both of these are right triangles. Just twist it around a little bit. The side across from the box is called the hypotenuse. So if it were this triangle, I would have to go across the box and label this one the hypotenuse. The other two sides are called legs, okay? So it doesn't matter which one you label which, um, you could call one of them A and the other one B or vice versa. It doesn't matter what you label them because they're both legs. What's important is that when you're applying the Pythagorean theorem, that your hypotenuse squared has to be on one side all by itself. And the other two legs have to be on the other side, okay? Notice it doesn't matter whether I write it like that or like this, it's the exact same equation because addition is commutative, right? It doesn't matter whether I do two plus three or three plus two, isn't the answer still five? Right? So it doesn't matter whether I do a squared plus b squared or a squared plus a squared. That fact is the whole reason it doesn't matter which one you label a and which one you label b. Okay? You can choose. But once you have identified whatever the a is gonna, whatever the a is gonna look like, whatever the b is gonna look like, and whatever the hypotenuse is gonna look like, then you can apply this formula and solve it. Okay? I don't know that they give us an example. But we'll look at the homework too if we have time. And if you do have one in the homework and we don't have time to get to it, you can always text me, right? You know that? Okay. So here now they're going to finally talk about what I was mentioning about those complex solutions, the imaginaries, right? If you're doing all of your math and inside that square root, you end up with the negative, you have to remember that it's an I. And you can write it like this as well. They always like to write the eyes in the back. I don't, because then people kind of accidentally stick it under the house and it doesn't belong under the house. When you take this negative out, it should not, the I should not be in the house anymore. Okay. And with this notation, it's very easy to like accidentally write this line a little too long. And then now the I looks like it's inside the house, which is bad notation. Okay. So I like to put it in the front just to avoid that whole situation from happening. Okay. But if you look at a problem, finally they're going to solve one. Use an example. I'm going to write down the quadratic formula over here first, just so we can see how they're getting everything. Now, remember that you have to start off with an equation in order to get that. Okay. So it has to look like this first in order for you to get to the solutions. Does mine already look like that? It does. So then what we want to do is we want to identify the A, the B, and the C. Most people do this visually, but for us, I want to make sure we write it out, okay? So what is A in this case? What is B? Correct, and that's the big thing is that you make sure you include that sign, okay? And then what about C? 
of the button. So always make sure that you include since that's positive, he's positive. Since that's negative, he's negative. Since that's positive, he's positive. Okay. Always make sure you include those signs. Then it's just a matter of plugging in everybody. Now notice what they do whenever they plug in numbers. I do it too. I've been doing it this whole time so far. Every time you plug somebody in, you always put it in parentheses. So notice that the B is in parentheses. The B here is also in parentheses. The A is in parentheses, the C is in parentheses, and the A is in parentheses again down there, right? And they did in fact plug the correct numbers, the B and the B, the A and the C, and then the A at the bottom, okay? So once you have everybody plugged in, you do have to do these problems in pieces. Okay, you have to calculate what's inside the radical first. You have to do that, okay? And then you can go ahead and simplify whatever's over here and whatever's down here at the same time. So it's like you have three little mini problems in one, okay? And you have to do those little mini problems before you look at the whole thing, okay? So if I do a double negative, that turns the two into what? A positive two. If I go to the bottom, these are the easier parts, two times three is just six, right? But if I plug this whole radicand inside my calculator, I should get this negative 56. But type it in exactly the way it is, parentheses and all, and make sure that you're using parentheses when you're plugging them in on your paper. I do get that negative 56, right? Now, we know that the, ne the 56, the negative is gonna come out as an I, Again, I usually write it in the front, but it's okay. They put it in the back. So really, I'm taking the square root of a positive 56. Can I type square root of negative 56 in my calculator? No, it just tells me error or no real solution or something. Let's see what it says. That's what it Domain error. So I cannot type the whole fraction in my calculator if it's a negative. And I won't know it's a negative until I've done this inside calculation, okay? So I did the inside calculation. My next step would be to take out the I and then tell my calculator, we'll find the square root of positive 56 because now the negative is not in there no more. And when I do that, I get this. And so for me, I would write that this two plus or minus this two with the I and then the square root of 14 and the six downstairs. So notice the difference between the way they wrote it and the way I wrote it, right? Only difference for me is that I don't like the I in the back. I like him in the middle before the rest. I don't care if you do it this way. It's not a big deal if you do it that way. Just make sure that the, the I is not inside the house, okay? You can totally do it that way. That's the more formal way but I just don't like to do it that way. And it accepts the answers if you do them properly. Now, notice that that's not their final answer, right? Because this can be reduced, but how the heck did they do it, okay? What they did was they took the two and put it over six. They took the plus or minus, took two i squared of 14 over six. Now you have to be careful this is kind of like a variable. This I right here, it's like a variable. I can't type it in my calculator, okay? What you're going to type in your calculator is two over six, so we can reduce it for you, and only the real parts that are outside the radicals can you reduce over here on this side. You cannot reduce this I squared to 14 at all. Don't even try. And if you do it, you're gonna get wrong, okay? You cannot reduce the i or the square root with a number that's not inside of the square root. Only numbers outside can reduce with numbers outside, okay? So if I type two over six on my calculator, it reduces it to this one third. So then that means this becomes one third. This one becomes one third with this i square root of 14 tacked on, right? And we already know that when we have a one in front of a variable, do we have to write this one? No. And so notice here, they don't write it. And not only that, in their final answer, what do they do with that I? Shove it in the back, didn't they? <laughs> they always wanna do that. They always want the answer like this. 
And so the I is always at the very, very far back. Okay. And it doesn't matter uh, which one we have. The computer won't care if I type this in the cap in the computer. It usually takes this as well. If for some reason it doesn't take that as your final answer, then go ahead and give them what they want. If it still doesn't take that, then you know you did something wrong. Okay. So I would try it like this. I'm pretty sure it does take it like this. Because that's normally how I always enjoy my answers. Um, but if it doesn't, try it with the eye on the side. Okay. Okay, so finally we get a practice one. I think I want to let you guys try it, so I'm going to turn my camera off, and then I will turn it back on with the solution. This one's not a word problem, it's just a regular, can you apply the quadratic formula? So let me pause the video, and I'm going to write the formula on the board, just for now. So there is the solution. And that was it for that one. So as long as you identify these guys correctly, you're plugging everybody in correctly, you're using that calculator to compute, you know, this, this, and this, and then you even use your calculator to reduce, you should end up with everything nice and neat. I personally try to do too much in my head sometimes, and then I end up with the wrong answers. I bring the point. But you have your calculator to help you try to avoid that. Now I'm gonna go turn this over. And we do have one of these problems. Now this one is a lot like number six, I think it is. Yeah, in the homework. Okay, so we are gonna do one that does look a lot like number six. If we have time, we'll do seven and eight as well, and nine. I think those are a little bit different. They're totally different scenarios. We haven't had an example for just yet. Um, I know they give you an example in there, so that's nice. But if we have time, we'll get to it. So it's saying that the floor of a one-story building is 14 feet longer than it is wide. And then the building has 1,395 square feet of floor space. Write an equa quadratic equation for the area of the floor in terms of W width. So they, I have to use W. I, I can't use X. They're specifically telling me I have to use W. Uh, find the length L and the width W of the floor. So for me, I know that W has to be the width. And then what would the length be? I don't have an image here, so I do have to like think about it. If I draw this room, this building, And I know that the width is W. What do I have to put for the length? Look at that first sentence. What does it say? Mm -hmm. It'll be, so if you make it 14 feet longer, you have to add that 14, right? So then I know the expression that represents the length is going to be W plus 14. Now, in the homework, you're kind of not as bad because they label it for you, don't they? Okay. Um, but that might not be the case. Oops. So, let's turn it over. There we go. so just make sure that if they don't give you the image, that you do create one yourself. Okay. Now, once we write the quadratic equation, well, remember, I know that the area equals the length times the width, right? Those to rectangles. And I know the area. That's 1395. I know the length, that's W plus 14, and the W is the W. Only thing I need to do is to distribute that W, and I have a quadratic equation. Now, it's not in its general form, like I need it to be to solve this thing, but that is a quadratic equation. So the computer will take this as your quadratic equation for part A, or if you go one step further and subtract that 1395 on both sides, it will also take this as the answer for part A. Both of those are going to be accepted. Are they equivalent? 
All they do is minus this number and minus it over here, right, on both sides. And so it will go away on the left, but then I would have a minus 1395 on the right. So either one of those versions of that quadratic equation will be accepted for part B. However, for me, in order to do part B, I have to have it in this form domain because it has to be in that general form in order for me to pick out what the A, B, and the C are. So here in this case, my A is what? My B, and the C. Negative. And so we're going to plug everybody in. We're going to get negative of B plus or minus B squared minus 4A C plus all over 2A. And then let's go for Q. So negative and a positive 14 is going to turn that into a negative 14. Um, I have no idea about that inside stuff. Let's see. The parentheses 42 squared minus 4, 1, negative 13, and 5. And this huge number. And then at the bottom, 2 times 1 is just 2. Now let's see if that big number will simplify. Oh, wow, it does. So then if I reduce that, I mean, I can write it out normally and don't write this stuff. I just reduce it. Normally I don't write this stuff. I just negative 14 over two in my calculator and then 76 over two in my calculator. And I need a plus or minus in the middle. But if you need to know where it came from, you can write it up. Okay. But I normally don't write this part. And then that's actually two answers, is it not? Right? So you get negative seven plus 38, and then you get negative seven minus 38. I get 31 and negative 45. Does this make sense? Oh, it's not x. What is my variable here? Is it x? It was an x, right? What was my variable? W. I had an x over here, but it shouldn't have been x. It should have been w. So that means this equals w or this guy equals w. Does that one make sense? I have a negative width. So this has to be my width. And if that's my width, we can go back up here and say, well, if W is 31, then that means that my length is a positive 45, right? And so now you have that measurement as well. Make sure that when you type it in the computer, let's go look and see what it looks like. I think it does have two different boxes, or it might just say type of with a comma. It does have individual boxes, so I would have to type the correct number there and then the correct number here for the link. Okay, so make sure you're typing it. And then for A, I already told you there's two different acceptable answers, right? Okay. I have one more on the paper that I want to solve before I get to these two, or actually all three, because they're all different. Um, shoot, there's four of them. That's okay. You're probably not going to get to all four of them, but we'll go as far as we can go. Whatever we don't do, we'll do the rest of them tomorrow, because okay? I want you to have an example to be able to work it out. Now, this one just says solve it using the quadratic formula, but I'm pretty sure this one's going to have an imaginary answer because we haven't had one yet uh, that we needed to do. So this is already in its general form. I'm just going to say A is 1, B is negative 4, and C is 13. And then I'm going to, the variable here is X this time. So I'm going to say negative B plus or minus. B 
squared minus four a c all over two a. Square root of 36 is actually 6. Now this, whenever you do have a variable times a number, how do we usually write? Like if I had x times 6, how would I write that? 6x, right? So this really should be written as 6i. And then again, I don't write this stuff, but if you do, that is OK. I just reduce. I reduce both of them by two and I'm good. You cannot combine these, they are not like terms. So do not try to add the two and the three together. The two is not an imaginary number, and the three is an imaginary number. Okay. Now I am going to try to do that problem from number seven. I'm going to go to the computer and then I'm going to write down the information and then we'll come back to the camera. Okay. So for number seven, it says a gardener has a hundred meters um, of fencing. And to enclose two adjacent rectangular gardens. So it shows you the figure there. I'm going to try to draw it over here on my paper. And you've got to cut the half. Okay, and then they say that this is X. This is X and then this is Y. And they have the equation 4X plus 3Y equal to 100. And it says the gardener wants to enclose an area of 336 square meters. What would the dimensions, what dimension should the gardener use to obtain this area? Okay. So okay. Go back to the camera. There we go. So I tried to do that. Um, oh, I forgot to write down the area. I need to have what area? 330. Okay, so that's what I've got there. Now we know that when we're doing the area, we know that area is going to equal length times width. Now the entire garden needs to be this length times width. Okay, so this is the length because it's, it appears to be longer than this measurement here, right? So I would call this the length of this garden and that the width of this garden. What is the expression that I'm going to plug in for the length? 
I know. It needs to be this and this the whole way across. Have any ideas? If from here to here is X, and from here to here is also X, what is it from here all the way to here? Ah, what is X plus X? So that means that the entire thing is going to be 2X. And then the width here is this measurement, which is just Y. And do I know what the actual area should be? The number I do, that's going to be 336 meters squared. So I have this, that's fantastic, I need that. But we cannot do the quadratic formula when there's multiple variables in here. So what I need to do is I need to put y in terms of x. Now notice that they've already given me this equation. So most of the time I have to come up with that equation. But here, they're nice on us. <laughs> they gave us the equation. But they told us that it was that he had 100 meters of fencing, right? Well, this is a fence. This is a fence. This is a fence. This is a fence. And this is a fence, right? So you've got x measurement once, x measurement a second time, x measurement a third time, and x measurement a fourth time. That's why there's four x's here. Then for the width, you have y measurement here, y measurement there, and y measurement here. Three of them, right? So you have three fences that are x meters long, and I'm sorry, four fences that are x meters long, and three fences that are y meters long. I just don't know what the x and the y are exactly yet, okay? I can take that whole equation because the total fencing is 100. I can solve this equation so that it looks like y equals something and there will be an x in there somewhere, okay? Once I know what this is, I can use it over here in this equation, okay? But how do I get that y by itself from this equation that was given to me? What would be my first step? Mm -hmm. You gotta get the whole term alone first, right? Before you can peel away the coefficient. So I still have a positive 3y. And you can write it 100 minus 4x, or you can do negative 4x plus 100. Either way is okay. What I'm saying verbally is you could have also written it like this. Right? That's the same thing. But what do I need to do next from there? To get the y completely alone. Divide by three. And so then what I end up with here is negative 4x plus 100 over three. Or I could have ended up with 100 minus 4x all over three. Same thing, it doesn't matter. Okay. But this expression does have an x in it. And so then I can plug it in for y. And once I do that, my equation will no longer have x's and y's, it'll just have x's. So I'm gonna say negative 4x plus 100 over three. Now me personally, as soon as I see a fraction, I do not like it and I want it to go away. Okay, so if you see a fraction and you want it to go away, just multiply both sides by that fraction, that denominator, and you can make it go away. So it will cancel over here. I have no idea what three times three, three, six is. Three, We are almost done. I just need to distribute. So I get negative 8x squared plus 200x. 
and I don't like my x squared guy to be negative, so I am actually going to move these two people over to that side instead of moving the, the 1008 over to the other side, just because I don't like my x squared guy negative. And when I'm factoring, I don't like the x squared guy negative. So I don't like the negative bigger. So if I add the 8x squared, I'll get positive. If I subtract the 200x, I'll get negative 200x. And this guy will stay exactly where he was, positive 108. But since I moved these guys both to the left of the equal sign, I will now have nothing on the right-hand side of the equal sign. And I truly don't want to sit there and try to factor that. It may not even be factorable. So I would, if I see this, just jump straight into that quadratic formula. So negative b plus or minus b squared minus 4 a c all over 2 a. So let's see that. Um, 200 squared minus 4 times a times Then let me see if there's a square root for that. Oh wow, there is. So then I get 25 over 2 plus 11 over 2, or 25 over 2 minus 11 over 2. So I get 18 and I get seven. So I actually get two answers that sound like they could be it, right? I didn't get negatives this time. So how do I know which one's the actual answer? Let's go see what happens. So if X is equal to 18, then y would equal negative 4 times this 18 plus 100 over 3. If x equals 7, then y will equal negative 4 times 7 plus 100 over 3. Let's do this problem correctly. Let's see. Black would be too good at the Oh, it does give me two answers. Okay, I'm not crazy. <laughs> I was like, wait a minute. Okay, so for this one, let's see, negative 4 times 18, close it, plus 100, divided by 3. Oh my gosh, let's just be bad like that. Negative 4 times 7 plus 100. I think that can be divided by 3. Negative 20. So then that gives you two answers. One of your answers is 18 and 28 over 3, and the other one is 7 and 24. Right? Your x value has to go first and then your y value. And so if you notice in the computer, it says it has two points, x, y, x, y, and they want you to put them in the boxes according to the x values. So the one that has the smaller x value is the one that goes on top, and the one with the larger x value will go on bottom. So for us, that would have been the 7 and the 24 at the top. Oh, my number thing is turned off. And then for the bottom, it'd be the bigger x value, and then it had that 28 over 3 uh, y value. You have to make sure you type them in there according to what they want. If they wanted the smaller x value at the top, bigger x value at the bottom. Okay. Um, we might have time for one more, but we'll have to leave the other two for tomorrow. Okay. So let me write down. Anybody still writing on the other one? This one? Uh, yes. Okay. I'll be back there for a minute. And then I will write down the for number
So um, what do you got? 18 and 7. <laughs> then flipped over to my rules, I got 4. Because these are x odds, right? x equals all of this mess. So yeah, so I just said, well, if x is 18, then y would be this thing with the 18 plug in, right? <laughs> But if x is 7, then y would be this same expression, but with a 7 plus difference. Okay, this one looks interesting. So it says you construct an open box from a square piece of material by cutting three centimeter squares from the corners. They're just chopping that off completely, a little corner, a little square corner, and then they're folding up the sides. And it says that the volume of that box that's now created um, is 300 cubic meters. So find the dimensions of the square piece of material that you used to construct the box. So let me write this down first. Try my best to write that little picture. Okay, so it's saying that this is um, X. This is H. I am not just going to try to draw that 3D picture, but <laughs> it's good to know. Okay. Um, but let me go over my paper. So I drew this and then notice that it's only telling me basically like this dotted line space is the X width. And then this part is the H. Now it did tell me what that measurement for H was. Well, how many centimeters did they say? I think it was three. Yes. Is a three centimeter cut that they're making. And then I know also that the volume equals 300 centimeters cubed. Okay, so I do know that this little measurement here is three and three and three and three and three and three. three. Because they're three little centimeter squares that they cut out of that piece of paper. Now I can try to draw a box. I don't know how successful I'm going to be drawing this box, but I'll try. Yes, I had to get it right. <laughs> Good, it's gonna get. Okay, so what they're telling me is that since they folded it up, when they fold on these little dotted lines, this little measurement here actually becomes your height, which is why they had this one labeled H. And we already know that that's gonna be three centimeters according to that first sentence, right? But when you fold along these dotted lines, now these measurements become your size. So this whole length is X and this whole length is X. And I only know that they're the same because it did say a square piece of metal and it be folded, right? And it has the same measurement for this width as it does the length. Okay. 
height. So it is going to be a box at the bottom with some sort of little height, um, completely square, and then a little bit of height. So when you calculate volume, that is going to be length times width times height. Okay. And so what is the length of this little box here? X. And what is the width of that box? And what is the height of that box? Three. And if I multiply all of that together, you end up with 3x squared, right? Do we know what the actual volume was? They tell us 300 square centimeters, yep. And so then this just happens to be my equation, which is great. That's not, it was a lot just to get here. <laughs> I wouldn't have wanted to solve some nightmare quadratic, right? <laughs> so this is not too bad. We can extract roots on this one. So I divide by three first and then take the square root. As long as you only have x squared all by itself, no other x's, you can do the extracting roots. It's just a lot faster. So I take square root on both sides, which means I automatically get plus or minus. And what's the square root of 100? Just 10. So then x could be 10 or x could be negative 10. But the negative one doesn't make sense for the length of a box, right? So it's only going to be the 10. Now, let me see how it has it in the problem. What's it? One in the box. So in the problem, it just says it wants to know the dimensions of the paper. Or the material, it doesn't say paper, it just says material. So they want to know the dimensions of the material. So they don't want to know the dimension of the box because that's what I know. I know that this measurement is 10 centimeters, right? But I wanted to know what the measurement of the material was. So I actually have to have this measurement. And right now, all I know is that this is 10, this is three, and this is three. So what is the measurement of the whole thing then? What is going to be this measurement? 16, because you're going to have three plus the 10 plus the other three, which is 16 centimeters. Got it. And since it's a square piece of material, what's the other side going to be? This one over here. Also 16, right? So then now I know the dimensions of the material. Is 16 centimeters by 16 centimeters. Okay, good. Should put this three in the red, right? Okay, I don't know what time it is, but I think we'll stop here. Yeah, we're like six five minutes, but I'm not gonna bother. I'll leave number nine and number ten for tomorrow. And it's actually good to kind of hang over just a bit because it lets us like see everything again a second time, at least for a few minutes before we jump into the next section, right? Okay. Um, so we'll do number nine and ten in the next class period and then start on the one point seven. Okay.